Hello everybody, Shrouded Hand here. Human history is filled with dark and disturbing events. The 20th century saw its fair share of atrocities and death. Two world wars, a major influenza pandemic, numerous genocides and ethnic purges that left a significant portion of the world drenched in blood. And of course, one of the very worst atrocities of the 20th century came during the Second World War. Millions of mainly Jewish people were forcibly confined in Nazi concentration camps and exterminated. One of the very worst of these camps was Auschwitz-Birkenau, also known as the Death Factory. Now, I'm sure that most people are very familiar with the haunting images of skeletal Auschwitz prisoners behind barbed wire. Within Auschwitz-Birkenau, the living conditions for certain prisoners were slightly better than others. However, these improved living conditions often came at a high price. Even in the very depths of hell, one could experience a fate much worse than death. When a new transport full of people arrived at Auschwitz, they were unloaded and then a selection process began. SS officers divided the newly arrived prisoners into two groups. The majority were placed on one side. These consisted of women, children, the elderly and the sick. They were predominantly destined for the gas chambers. Men who appeared strong and healthy were directed to the other side. Many of these men were chosen to become the Sonderkommando, a special force that were tasked with operating the very machinery of death. One Auschwitz survivor would later remark that these men were ripped from their everyday lives and, without warning, they were cast into the very deepest pits of hell. The gas chambers in Auschwitz did one thing. They turned innocent living people into corpses. Hundreds of thousands of corpses. The main job of the Sonderkommando was to empty the gas chambers after the executions, then search the bodies and burn them. Obviously, the men in the Sonderkommando found the job extremely disturbing, but they had two choices, either do the job or face immediate execution. The Sonderkommando inmates were divided into five groups, each consisting of about 200 men. Each group was assigned to one of the five crematoriums. Within these crematoriums, they were further divided into smaller working groups, with each group having a distinct task. The first group was assigned to work on the loading ramps when new transports arrived. Their job was to ensure that panic didn't break out, so they were forced to deceive the newcomers by telling them that they were headed for showers and disinfection. To maintain calm among these new arrivals, the Sonderkommando inmates would offer seemingly helpful tips. For example, they'd advise the newcomers to tie their shoes together after undressing and to remember to place their clothes in the changing room. Many of the Sonderkommando avoided looking into the newcomers' eyes. They knew that these people were destined for the gas chambers and there was no coming back. One survivor's account describes how a man was tasked with leading the new arrivals from the train to the gas chamber. This man suddenly recognised his cousin in the crowd and he was faced with an impossible dilemma. Should he reveal the terrifying truth to his cousin or should he just maintain the lie? He knew that whatever he did, the outcome would be the same, so he chose to lie. He told his cousin the same thing he told every new inmate, that they were simply going for a shower. He then ensured that his cousin stood directly under the hole where the Zyklon B pellets were dropped in, hoping that this would mean his cousin would have a swift death. And of course, the Sonder Commander would also know that it wasn't a swift death. They would hear the screams of people from within the gas chamber going on for 15-20 minutes before they went silent. After that, the gas chamber would be ventilated and another group of the Sonder Commando would get to work. When the door was opened, the Sonder Commando would be faced with rows and rows of dead people. 
Often the people were packed so tightly into the chambers that the bodies remained standing after death. At times the corpses were horrifically entwined. This was either due to death convulsions or because a panic-stricken individual tried to climb atop another in a desperate attempt to escape the gas. According to survivor accounts, there were around 800 corpses in a gas chamber each time. The Sonder commandos had to use canes to hook the bodies under their chins and drag them out. At first they approached this task carefully, trying to be respectful for the dead, but as time and repeated exposure dulled their sensitivities, they grew increasingly indifferent to the task. The bodies would be taken from the chamber, placed into a lift and taken up to the upper level. On the upper level, another group of Sonder Commando had to cut the hair from every single body. The hair had to be removed before the bodies could be put into the ovens. This group were also the ones tasked with searching the bodies for jewellery and gold. One Sonder Commando would later confess that they all knew where to search for valuables. There's only so many places where a naked person can hide a golden ring or a diamond. After the bodies were shaven and searched, they were sent to the next group of Sonder Commandos. This group was known as the Dentists. They were each equipped with a pair of dentistry pliers. They examined the mouths of every corpse, searching for gold teeth. These teeth were extracted and the gold was later smelted into bars and collected by the SS. After the dental examination, the Sonder Commando divided the bodies into two piles, one for adults and another for children. The final group of Sonder Commando operated the ovens. They laid two corpses in front of each of the five ovens, then stacked them onto a metal stretcher. They then placed a child's corpse on top and shoved the bodies into the oven. After the bodies had been cremated, the Sonder Commando would remove the ashes and dump them into a nearby river. One survivor recounts a story of an inmate working at the ovens. At some point, this inmate stopped loading the bodies onto the stretcher and stood motionless, gazing at the corpses. After a prolonged pause, he resumed his work. An SS officer who was stood nearby asked why the man had stopped. Another inmate replied, he's just recognised his wife. And these kind of incidents where the Sonder Commando recognised their murdered family members weren't rare. The crematorium ovens were burning day and night, thousands of people passing through them each day. The trauma of it was so overwhelming that it would shatter even the most resilient of spirits. For the most part, the Sonder Commando were isolated from the other prisoners in the camp. Their own quarters were located within the crematoriums. In some cases, they slept right above the gas chambers. They were officially forbidden to communicate with any other inmates. However, some contacts were made. And as I suggested at the beginning of the video, some inmates had better conditions than others and the Sonder Commando were kept reasonably well fed and the SS knew that they needed their strength to be able to carry out their tasks. They weren't starved and tortured to the same extent as the other inmates. This marginally better treatment of the Sonder Commando had another purpose. As the Sonder Commandos had to greet the new arrivals at the camp, the prisoners would be greeted by someone who looked relatively well fed. It would give the illusion that things weren't too bad. Their living quarters were also slightly better than the regular inmates, and their work indoors shielded them from a lot of the harsh elements. However, this treatment was somewhat of an illusion. Their job was so terrible that their minds would break. Many would go insane from the horrors of what they witnessed. And to keep the Sonder Commando from telling anybody about what was happening in the crematoriums, every two to three months, the Sonder Commandos would be rounded up and executed. There was always a new trainload of young men who could be used to replace them. Tragically, one of the first tasks of a newly recruited Sonder Commando was to burn the bodies of their predecessors. 
Another inmate, a man from the main camp, recalled how one rainy evening he found himself near the camp's mortuary which was situated in the basement of one of the blocks. He noticed a line of men waiting at the mortuary's entrance. When he asked them what they were doing, he received a chilling response. One of the men pointed at the door at the bottom of the stairs and explained, Down there, behind that door, is death. This is our end. Behind these doors, the SS are ending us. The inmates asked them why they weren't running or hiding or trying to do anything to save themselves. The man replied, We are the Sonder Commando. We've been broken. We've wasted away. This is our way out of this hell. Only a few Sonder Commandos survived the war. Morris Venezia was one of these survivors. In his testimony he recalls the day when transports of Jewish people from Hungary arrived. It was some 30,000 people. The ovens had reached their maximum capacity and they couldn't accommodate the sheer number of dead bodies. The Sonder Commando were forced to dig pits behind the crematorium and fires were lit in the pits to burn the excess bodies. Sometimes miracles happened as well, although they were short-lived. One Sonder Commando recalled how a baby survived the gas chamber with its head squeezed beneath its mother's arm. The baby was later shot by an SS officer and its body thrown onto the pile. In another instance, a man regained consciousness just as he was about to be dragged into a fire pit. The man seemed confused and asked what was going on. There was no time to return him to the gas chamber, so on the orders of the SS, the Sonder Commando had no choice but to just throw him alive into the fire pit. After the final transport from Hungary had been exterminated and the bodies burned, it became clear that there would be no work left for the Sonder Commando, at least for some time. They knew that a purge was imminent, soon they would be executed too, and so inmates working at Crematorium 4 decided to plan a revolt. The men working in Crematorium 4 were busy making makeshift knives and homemade hand grenades. These grenades were constructed from tin cans and black powder that had been smuggled in by women working in the aircraft repair facility outside the camp. On the 7th of October 1944, one of the Sonder Commandos walked up to an SS officer and smashed him over the head with a hammer. This was the sign to start the uprising and suddenly the camp erupted into chaos with prisoners surrounding their guards with knives, hammers and black powder bombs. Apparently one of the SS officers who was known to be particularly sadistic was rounded up, thrown into one of the ovens and burned alive. Some prisoners managed to cut a hole in the fence and escape from the camp, but unfortunately their victory was short-lived. The uprising was quelled, all the escapees were quickly rounded up, the Santa Commando were executed, as were the women who had helped them in making the bombs. By January of 1945, the Soviet army were rapidly advancing, and so plans were set in motion to liquidate the Auschwitz concentration camp. As the front lines grew nearer, all the crematoriums in Auschwitz were blown up in an attempt to destroy any evidence of the genocide. The Nazis knew that any witnesses would also have to be executed. Just before the camp's evacuation, a final selection took place. Those inmates who still appeared healthy were separated. They were marched to another concentration camp in Germany, an event that would later be known as the Auschwitz Death March. The sick and weak inmates, along with the remaining members of the Sonder Commando, were separated from this main group. Their impending fate was no secret. They knew that they were about to die. However, due to the general chaos and the apparent disarray of the SS, a few of the Sonder Commandos managed to discreetly change groups and mix in with those who were being taken to the other camp. Those who escaped this final selection were still in grave danger. An SS officer could recognise them at any moment. 
the challenge of being forced to march hundreds of kilometres in the harsh Polish winter was ever present and each day this marching group would leave behind dozens of frozen corpses. Some inmates managed to escape during this death march, whilst others reached the concentration camps deep within German territory and there they endured further months of torment. Several thousand inmates had been forced to work in the Sonderkommando, but by the end of the war less than 20 had survived. Out of the surviving Sonderkommandos, only a handful decided to testify, and for good reason. Initially, these men were seen as being Nazi collaborators. However, as time went on, more and more testimonies from Holocaust survivors emerged and with it came a better understanding of the kind of predicaments that the Sonderkommandos were faced with. After the war, several notes were found within the ruins of the Birkenau crematories. These notes described the horrific experiences of the Sonderkommando inmates, and these notes have served as some of the most striking evidence of the genocide. And that was the story of the Sonderkommando. A bit of a different subject for my channel, but I hope you found that informative. A huge thanks as always to everybody who supports the channel on Patreon. Thank you very much. I don't do a lot of history type stuff on this channel but if you find disturbing tales interesting then uh, why not check out some of my other stuff you might find that interesting as well until next time goodbye